Uh, I'm Adam Roth, director of the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. <laughs> I am not the speaker this evening, just introducing. Uh, we're really pleased to welcome you to the 11th annual Christian Amanpour Lecture in Journalism, sponsored and endowed by Christian Amanpour herself, a 1983 graduate of the Harrington School's Department of Journalism, a 1995 honorary degree recipient from the University of Rhode Island, and CNN's chief international correspondent and host of the Global Nightly Affairs news program on CNN and PBS titled Amanpour and Company. Along with additional support today from Dean Jen Riley and the College of Arts and Sciences Event Fund, Professor Justin Wyatt, the new Associate Director of the Harrington School, Professor John Panaloni, Chair of the Department of Journalism, Ann Salzarulo, the Coordinator of the Harrington School, and Jeff Fountain, who's hiding behind a curtain over there, our new Manager of Broadcast Services for the Harrington School and the University. We're really excited to feature Carol Ratsywell as this year's Amanpour Lecturer. You probably already know that Carol is an internationally renowned, award-winning journalist and producer, a New York Times best-selling author, and a regular household name and TV celebrity. These descriptions, however, barely scratch the surface in describing the breadth of her professional experience and the depth of her true character as a person as well. And who better this evening to introduce our speaker formally than Carol's friend and ours, Ms. Christiane Amanpour. Good evening, everyone. And I'm so sorry not to be there in person with you. I'm actually in my own studio getting ready for my live show. But I am really thrilled to be introducing tonight's speaker, Carol Radziwill, for our annual Amanpour Lecture in the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island, my alma mater. Many of you may know Carol as a major reality star over the last several years. However, the bulk of her work has been firmly anchored in real hard news, which makes her a perfect person for tonight's talk. Carol's work as a journalist began at ABC News. The segments she produced aired across the programming, including Primetime Live 2020 and World News Tonight, the flagship evening program. And she's won many distinguished awards for her journalism, three Emmys, a Robert F. Kennedy Humanitarian Award, and a GLAAD Award. Now, like I did, Carol covered the first Gulf War back in 1991, and in 2001, right after 9-11, she spent a month embedded with the 101st Airborne Division in Kandahar during the Afghanistan War. On that assignment, Carol filmed the ABC docu-series Profiles from the Front Line. It was really brilliant. Still, appreciating her robust career in journalism does not complete Carol's story. Because in 1999, she was reeling from a double tragedy of unimaginable proportions. Not only did her beloved husband, my good friend Anthony Radzuel, succumb after a long battle with cancer, but a month earlier, their great friends and cousin, John Kennedy Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren were all killed in a plane crash off Martha's Vineyard. Carol's courage, her honesty, and her transparency emerged in the form of a remarkable memoir on grief, and it's called What Remains, a memoir of fate, friendship, and love. It was published in 2005, and it recounts with often painful candor and sharp focus Carol's upbringing, her career in journalism, and her struggle with that deep personal loss. Carol's contributions to Glamour magazine, her novel, The Widow's Guide to Sex and Dating, and her six seasons as a cast member on Bravo's hit show, The Real Housewives of New York, all evidence her ability to share her journey in life with humor, kindness, and deep insight. And so now, everyone in the room, please welcome to the stage my friend, the renowned journalist and author, Carol Radziwill. Can you hear me? 
Wow, this is exciting. I have to wait till they change the set behind me. So, um, but I, I just want to say what is an honor it, it is to be here. I spent the day at the university and um, uh, saw some of the the schools, some of the dorms. Uh, I went to the cafeteria, um, and it it, 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 it made me nostalgic for my own uh, days in, in college. Although, I, as I was saying, I didn't. Um, I, I went to hunt, a Hunter in New York City, so I commuted back and forth, so I never had this campus experience. But um, I feel like I missed that on something, so now I, I had it for the day. That was some introduction, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it fun to have a friend like Christiane Amanpour? <laughs> um, I, I, I hope that I, I uh, raised to the level of her uh, perfectionism. Um, you know you've made it when you have a cup. And Christiane has definitely made it. Um, it's funny because I, um, I had originally um, written a speech with um, like sort of more of a high-minded speech about journalism in this like sort of post-truth age we're all living in, uh, which I call post-truth age because it's sometimes difficult for people to um, discern between fact and fiction. Um, but then I decided, you know, if I was a college kid, what would I like to hear? And then I decided I was just going to tell some stories about um, my adventures in journalism leading up to and through my adventures in reality television. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to start, I, I brought cards because I, as anyone who knows me, I have a tendency to really ramble on. And I only have 45 minutes. <laughs> So I want to keep, um, but I'll start a little bit uh, about the reality show, and then we'll go back in time. But and I only bring this up because when I was asked to do it, um, I was 47 years old, and 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 I remembered thing, and and I and I had had this long career at ABC and and published some books, um, and it was completely counterintuitive to anything that I had done in my past. And I remember calling Christiane and saying. I've been asked to do this reality show, and she didn't know what it was. I said, it's, it's called Housewives, and it's a lot of women, and they talk loudly over each other a lot, <laughs> and they're very opinionated. And I kind of feel like it would be an interesting thing to do, but am I crazy? And, and you know, to her credit, she said, and, and, and she was absolutely right, she's like, it makes perfect sense. And I'm like, how, how so? And she said, because journalists are, by nature and training, curious. And just as journalists are attracted to the spectacle of politics and war, um, we are also attracted to the spectacle of this cultural phenomenon known as housewives. And so in that context, I thought, you know, she's right. It, it did make sense. And I was interested in, even though I'd never seen the show, I was interested in what everyone was talking about and what it would be like to be on one of those shows instead of behind the scenes. So, Hence, uh, I did. She also said, and you know, you're a single girl with bills, and you've got, you know, you've got, um, you can sell some books, and it actually did sell some books. So um, it was, a, it was a win-win. But six years later, I never thought I would, I would be on it for six years. But let me, I will go back. In, uh, I will go back because I want to give um, those of you who are just uh, in school or just getting out of school a, a sense of what, how I got from where I grew up to to reality. And um, I think, you know, it, a lot of people obviously know me from the show, and, um, and it all looks sort of glamorous and sort of sex in the city. And, um, but I'm not that. I, I, I was a girl who grew up in upstate New York, um, working class, Italian family, didn't know any, didn't have any contacts, didn't, wasn't, and I, I'd like to say that we, like, we were a family who sat around the dinner room talking about current events, and, but that would be a lie because um, I could probably hum the theme song to MASH, and I know every episode of The Brady Bunch, but we did not, and I have a vague recollection of my mom watching the Watergate hearings, but we were not that family that was um, talking about current events. But I did know from an early age that I wanted, I, I had a sense that there was a bigger world out there. And I desperately wanted to, to see the world. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I liken it to like being a little kid and having your, like your nose pressed up against the town limit sign and like looking and saying, what is out there? And 
having really no means to travel and stuff, I thought, well, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to travel around the world and make some money. And originally I thought I'd be a flight attendant because my, my aunt was and it seemed super glamorous and cool and she would be, she'd be traveling all over the world. So as an early, like a young teen, I thought, that's what I'm going to do. And I realized kind of slowly as I got older, it's probably not what, what I was going to do. Um, but I had my aha moment, the moment where it all crystallized for me. Um, I was in school. I, was, I went to Hunter College in New York City. And um, it was 1985 or 86. And um, I was sitting in my parents' kitchen at home in the kitchen and watching the Challenger lift off um, in the, in, on the television. And as we know, what happened, it blew up. And I became just fixated with the, this story. And not only this story, but all of the news coverage around the story. And then it just in my head, I don't know, it was, it was that moment where I thought, that's what, I, that's what I'm meant to be doing. I'm not meant to be watching it on television in my parents' kitchen in upstate New York. I, I'm meant to be there. I want to be where things were happening and witness history uh, firsthand. And um, from that moment on, I you know, thought, OK, where's the best place to do it? And ABC News, this is all my re extensive research. ABC News was the number one network at the time. So I said, OK, well, I like that. I want to be with the, at the number one network. And um, again, I didn't uh, know a soul. I didn't, you know, and, but I, and, I, and I didn't have an Ivy college. So I was just going to get there any means that I could. So I started um, going to these job fairs. They probably don't have them anymore because everything's on the internet now. Um, and I would go to these job fairs, and I would hand out my resume and to anyone who would take it, which was barely anyone. And it, it, I think it had like a one, uh, I was part of the AV committee at, at this pharmaceutical company up where I lived. And that was prominent on my, on my resume, other than waitressing at night and stuff like that. Um, but by luck and chance, and uh, I handed it to someone who said, uh, well, I'm going to give it to this woman. Her name is Annette Kreiner, I'll never forget. And I was like, oh, I know Annette Kreiner. I know that name. She's the head of 2020. And I had sent her my resume already. And, and I never heard back. I was very upset. <laughs> um, so he said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll slip it to her and see, you know, we'll make sure she calls you. And sure enough, like two days later, Annette Kreiner calls. And uh, this was life changing. I didn't maybe know it at the time, but um, I got on the bus, the red and tan lines from Suffer, New York, and I went down to the city to do my, to, to be interviewed. I kind of had this feeling it was a job interview, and I was like, oh, make some money, I'm going to be working in the city. Um, and I remember taking a lot of time to pick out the perfect outfit. I don't know why, you know, uh, this, this, I, I wanted to look the part because I felt like I was, I felt like a little bit like young people sometimes do, like I wasn't deserving of this job and she's going to find out I'm just some kid from upstate New York and and who who you know who am I to be you know working at 2020 so I picked out I took a great time to pick out my outfit and I, I modeled it after this uh, movie called broadcast news that was out recently and Holly Hunter was <laughs> the producer and I wanted to be Holly Hunter I'm like oh god if I could only be Holly Hunter that she is living my life that I want to live and she it was, a it was like sort of a, the style of the times so that you would, um, you, some of you will remember, you buttoned your shirt all the way up to the top and you put a pin here. <laughs> you remember that? I love that style. So I put on a black wool skirt and I had like a black like pleplum little jacket thing all buttoned up and I put a pin here. I go in and I talk to a neck criner, vegan neck criner and, and um, and she offers me this internship. I didn't care that it was an internship and I wasn't getting paid. Um, and uh, she said I had to go to the third floor and get my picture taken. I got an ID right then, that, that day. Um, and on my way out, she, she said, oh, and by the way, we don't, we don't dress up that much here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I didn't care. Then I quickly adapted to the uniform of journalists. Um, uh, you know, sort of khaki pants and a white button down and um, very casual. And I loved everything about it. I was the best intern that they had ever seen. I 
did, there was nothing that I would not do. I mean, I thought connect, like producers would call from like Beirut and they'd have to be connected to the news desk. And, you know, it was life and everything to me was life or death. Everything was the most important thing. Pe you know, the producers had to have, I knew what, like, if some producers liked yellow legal pads, if some like white legal pads, some like to use this kind of pen or that, I was, I knew everything and I was there to do anything. I remember one producer used to drive into work and in New York City, you, you have to alternate the sides of parking like at 11 and I'd be there at 11 a.m. moving his car over to the other side. And um, it was a three month internship and I, I, and three months was up and, and I just stayed. I don't even know if they, knew I was staying, <laughs> to be honest. I just stayed. I was like, no one's even asking me to leave. And, I, <laughs> and that is like how I got my foot in the door. And I think they felt, they were like, all right, we gotta start paying her. <laughs> and they did, in my first year, I made $11,500. That was the salary, and, and it, was, it was, I mean, it might as well have been the lottery. I was so happy, I was, Finally, like I was finally on my way to becoming a, a Holly Hunter, um, and um, I, 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 I was a desk assistant, production secretary. I was everything. If you wanted the supply closet cleaned out, I would do it. Um, if you wanted, I was very organized. So I'm a Virgo, Moon Virgo. So you know, label, everything was labeled. Every, I was, I did just about everything anyone would ask, and. Um, I guess I got noticed because Peter Jennings was decided to start a documentary unit. And um, he, he um, and this was, this was a big deal because A, no one watched documentaries and put documentaries on network news. It was a, it was a fight. And, but Peter Jennings had a lot of clout and this is what he wanted to do and he wanted to cover more, mostly foreign stories. And um, he, and, and there were six of us in this little unit, and I was picked uh, to be part of it. I was the desk assistant, production secretary. I didn't care what I was. I was just like part of this little, what I consider this like elite unit within ABC News. I was only gonna work for Peter Jennings and do these amazing documentaries, and all of that came true. And, um, and, I, and I remember to this day, like it was yesterday, the boss calling me into his office and saying, um, you know, we have this assignment. Peter's very interested in Cambodia. I'm like, I'm very interested in Cambodia also. Well, <laughs> Cambodia. I'm like, I don't know if I could place it on a map, but it's like <laughs> over there. But I'm like, I know everything about Cambodia. I love Cambodia. I mean, <laughs> I'd never literally been outside Suffern, New York up until, uh, I was like, uh, and he said, okay. Um, you know, we're gonna send you, we're, we're doing this documentary on f foreign policy in Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge, this was 1989, uh, the Khmer Rouge had taken over and they were sort of settled, you know, they, they were kicked out by the Vietnamese and it was a Vietnamese installed government and the United States was not happy that Vietnam installed this government. So there was no relationship with Cambodia because of this. This was sort of like a byproduct of the Vietnam War. Um, none of which I knew at the time sitting in that office. But I knew I was smart enough and, and clever enough to spend, and I had two months to, uh, before I was gonna go over to Cambodia and spend like, I ended up spending almost six weeks there in, in Thailand and Vietnam. And um, so I, I did what, you know, what, what uh, every journalist uh, does by, by nature. Um, I learned everything there was to know about Cambodia and foreign policy in Vietnam and, and the Vietnam War. I mean, I took detailed notes. I had research binders, maybe 20 research binders. I shipped them over to, to Thailand where we were based. And that was my first story, my first big assignment. And uh, like any first big thing, it was the benchmark for all the rest. It was like my first love. It was, I guess I, I equated it to like your first child, but I don't have kids, so I don't think that's a good analysis. Apparently, you like your children equally. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, it, was, um, it was a heady, amazing, interesting, like crazy experience. And I worked with who later became my mentor, this woman, Leslie Coburn. If anyone is uh, from Virginia, she's actually running for Congress. Uh, this, this year, November 6th, the Virginia 5th District, and we're hoping that she wins. She's, she was like, um, I, I called, she was like the Madonna of the news business. She was 
I don't know, six foot blonde, brilliant, fearless, like in, very courageous woman uh, who produced all these stories. Like a lot, she was always in the places, much like Christian, that you never want to go. And like if Leslie showed up, it wasn't <laughs> what I always say this about Christian. If she shows up, it's not good. <laughs> um, because there's usually something really bad happening. But um, she, but Leslie was um, my mentor, and she she came over, and she I pretty much taught me everything like I I needed to know. A lot of um, her her style I remember was don't, assume stuff you don't know. That's a very good trick for a journalist. You have to assume information that you don't have, and then people start talking, you know. Um, and she did this brilliantly, and I just watched and learned from her, and and. Um, uh, there was, Peter was coming over. Peter's like moving Peter around the world is like moving a rock star. So um, I'll never forget this. I'll tell you this one funny story because it, it's, uh, two th I had to fly to Vietnam to get a charter for Peter to go from uh, Bangkok to Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. There was no, because we didn't have a relationship with Cambodia at the time, there was no flights. You couldn't get a commercial flight, you only could charter. So they sent me, some brilliant person at headquarters in New York called me when I was in Thailand and said, you gotta go to Hanoi and, and book a charter. And I was like, okay. Uh, uh, talk to Mr. C at the embassy. Mr. C can help you. That's all, that was his name, Mr. C. So I go to Mr. C at the embassy in, in Bangkok and he arranges me to go to Hanoi. And, uh, and two things I remember about Vietnam. Well, one thing is Michael Bolton. I mean, I'm sure everyone thinks of Michael Bolton when they think of Vietnam, but <laughs> I, I um, this is before iPods, and you had like CD disc players. And I had this with me because you're traveling around a lot alone and I like to listen to music. And I brought my CD and I forgot all my, I brought, I brought the player, but I forgot all my CDs except for the one that was in there, <laughs> which happened to be Michael Bolton. And the funny thing is, is, well, I'm digressing, but I later met him, like, I met him like two years ago. This is 30 years later and I told him that story. He was like, what? <laughs> Anyway, I get to Vietnam and, and uh, I have a meeting with the president of the, of the um, airline. They wanted to charge us something like $20,000 for this charter. I, very smartly, I thought negotiated it down to $13,000 and then I had to pay $6,000 uh, then and then $6,000 when we, we, we used the charter. I was like, great, oh my God, they're going to love me in New York. I'm negotiating with this Vietnamese president of this airline through translators, and um, so I was supposed to go back the next day to, to give them the deposit. But I, you know, because I'm efficient and maybe because I'm a Virgo, I did one step further. I said, you know what, I'm gonna go and take my 6,000 US dollars and I'm gonna go to the bank, the Hanoi Bank in the square, and I'm gonna convert it into Vietnamese dong. So it's easier for him to have his own uh, currency. So I, I show up back at the office of the airline, with literally a suitcase full of Vietnamese dong. <laughs> well, I, let's just say that uh, there was a, a lot of screaming and yelling, all in Vietnamese, none of which I understood, but I understood one thing, that I had somehow made a mistake. <laughs> and I went back to the bank and converted it back to US dollars. Uh, I never told anyone at ABC that I had, there was some like um, rate exchange, uh, uh, so I lost money on both ends. And, um, but I ended up getting the charter and Peter Jennings got safely back and forth in, uh, to, to Cambodia um, with the, with, in this charter. And I, I don't really, I've never ever told that, I didn't tell that story to anybody the whole time I was at ABC and it was 15 years. I've only started recently telling that story. Um, and now I look back, it was, I was a 24 year old kid who had never, who had never been outside her, her you know, small town. And, and I just thought I was being helpful. But I will say the, the one thing about, what, what I learned from that, the story was, it was, I learned so much just being in the field and being with Leslie and, deal, and, and working with Peter Jennings. But when it aired, and this never quite happened the same way again, which is why you have to take every experience and really treasure it. With the, the documentary aired and it won lots of awards because it was, it was you know, one of the first documentaries to expose this, what I thought and what many people thought was a hypocritical policy of the US policy against Cambodia at the time. And um, uh, 
it aired and like the next week Congress met and they changed policy. They, they actually voted, uh, it was headed by Senator Leahy, I think, voted to change the policy that the US policy had with Cambodia. And for the first time since before or during the Vietnam War, we sent humanitarian aid directly into the country. And this was a really big deal. And I thought it was, and it became the benchmark for everything else, but it was, um, it was just like the, you felt like, you know, that whole cliche that you're changing the world. But in that one like brief moment, we did. And for those people in Cambodia that received that aid, we changed their lives. And it's, it's a powerful feeling that you kind of hang on to. And, and uh, it's, the, it's also the power of truth telling that you go to this country and you tell the truth about what's going on and how that affects people and how that can affect change. So it was, a, it was and it was my first. So of course, nothing quite ended up matching that level of, we, I never changed policy again, but there were other you know, wonderful lessons in, in some of the other stories that I, that I worked on. Um, and then because I was like an internet, apparently an internationally renowned journalist, <laughs> having a little bit of experience in Cambodia when the Gulf War broke out, you know, everyone. The funny thing about journalists is they're, they're not like normal people, like they're not afraid of the things that normal people are afraid of. So when the Gulf War broke out, there was not a single person working at ABC that did not want to go to Kuwait or to Iraq or anywhere, anywhere close near. And I always thought, when I wrote about this, I thought it, um, it, there's something about the power of living in the frayed edges of, of life um, that is alluring to people who are attracted to journalism. Um, it's not a safe place, um, but it feels, it feels uh, safe to, to those of us who pursue it. Um, I mean, Christiana has been every place in the world, very, very dangerous places. Um, in Bosnia in the early 90s, it was more like, a, a, you know, the wild, wild west. Um, the Gulf War, I finally, I enlisted, I finally got, I was able to go over, I, I landed in Israel. And um, it's interesting how when you, you're there, when you're watching on television, it's very intense. There's something about the edited version of what I would consider a very organized war that makes it much more intense than when you're actually there. I remember being at the hotel, and this was kind of posh because we all stayed at the, the International Continental uh, Hotel in Tel Aviv, which was like a Four Seasons, I guess. And, but you know, this is the time when Saddam Hussein was, was firing um, Scud missiles at Israel, and there was some question about whether or not there were chemical warheads attached. And the sirens would go off every other night, every three nights, and you knew that there was some incoming missile. And the regular, the normal people would go into the basement and everyone had hazmat gear, and all the journalists you'd see up on the roof. <laughs> and it, it never occurred to any of us to go into the basement. Um, we just all had to be on the roof because we wanted to see what was going on. And, um, and I remember one time watching, I forget who the correspondent was, but he was a CNN correspondent and he was doing a stand-up, which is the live to camera thing that you always see um, when people from the, f in the field doing. And, um, and I was watching him, I was watching him do it at the same, oh, it was on a balcony, that's right, and I was on the balcony next to it. And as he was recording it, I was list seeing it on television. And there was something much more menacing and dark and scary about watching it on television than it was watching it in the open air on the balcony like this. That, and I just thought that's so interesting how it can really, it changes your perspective of what's really going on. But um, when we came back, well, before we, before we, I'll just say one more funny story because it has to do with reality. Before I went to Israel, we decided, we decided this little group that we were gonna go to the White House and ask uh, the president and John Sununu, who was chief of staff, if we could, you know, follow them around in the lead up to the war, and miked, and just be like fly on the wall. And, um, and so we, we, took, we took this meeting with John Sununu, and we explained that this program would be really interesting insight, and we would, we would, we would cast it, we would take like five 
players have them mic'd and just, you know, follow them around cinema verite style um, and just inter however they're interacting in meetings and stuff. And what, what it really was, it was like the original reality show, but we didn't know it at the time, but we wanted to cast it and like hopefully there was drama. And I remember Johnson, you know, <laughs> looking at, and we said we want to do this for historic purposes. And he was a tough guy. He, and he looked uh, straight. It, Peter wasn't there. It was like me, like the PA and the executive producer and someone else. He looked us straight in the, in the eyes and said, I don't understand. What does television have to do with history? And we were like, wow. <laughs> Jeez, I <don't> know, like, <laughs> I mean, he like cut us down. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be harder. But um, it was like, it was like we were proposing so in, our, in our sort of, you know, um, delusion or excitement about this program we're proposing basically to film a reality show in the White House in the lead up to it, to the Gulf War. Clearly, we never got it. We never, we never, we never were allowed to do it. Um, but it was, um, it was, it was the time when I really, I, I referred to the reality shows as this too, was the time we wrote a letter thanking him for the meeting and stuff. And um, we understood that that filming the, filming the um, events would change the events, much like the Heisenberg theory of an economic study. Studying atoms changes them, so you can't really study them. And, uh, and that was a term that always stayed with me because I think of the reality show that I was previously on. And, and that's the same thing. The, cam the, the, the presence of cameras in a room just changes everything. And I, I took that sort of lesson away with me, and I know, and, and I, you could see it, like in every story you did, people, especially politicians, would act a little, you know, there was a TV version and then there was the, the, real, the real meetings that were going on. Um, but I came back from that war, um, was there probably three weeks. Um, I never really actually got, we would, we would the Scud missiles would come, come in and we would just travel and take, we would always get out there way after the, the, the time and we would take some, footage and stuff, but really 90% of my time was in the hotel. So I didn't really get to see like, you know, what war was like, except from the Intercontinental Hotel in Tel Aviv. Um, but when I came back, we, Peter was doing a, a documentary on, um, he was doing two, one on gun control and one on abortion, which is, then this was, this was in 1992. And it's funny, because I was just talking about this to someone and they said, oh, wow, we're still talking about that, gun control and abortion. And um, I got assigned to the abortion documentary. It's called The Politics of Abortion. And the one thing, I mean, the one thing that really was interesting, um, I mean, there was a lot of going on. And there was, it was an interesting topic. We were, um, the uh, Louisiana state legislature had passed a bill um, restricting abortion. Um, criminalizing it, in effect. Um, uh, the doctors would go to prison if they performed abortions. It was a very, very strict anti-abortion measure. And the governor, Governor Buddy Romer, was in a very tough position of having to veto it in a very conservative state. And so we did follow him around on, the, on, on his journey of what, what would happen to this bill. And, and um, in the process, uh, I went to cover a... Um, a rally. The pro-life movement had a very large rally in Washington, and we went down to cover that as part of this as part of this uh, story. And the and the producer I was working with at the time had this great style of um, he would put the he'd mic everyone, and then he'd put the camera like it would be way in the back, and you wouldn't see it. And he had these long lenses, and he would shoot it this way. So it had the effect of people would forget that the cameras were around, and it was very effective. And while we were filming the pro-life march, um, the organizers of it set, um, were discussing behind, you know, behind the, the curtain, they were discussing how many people were at this march. And there, there was a lot of people at the march. There might have been 250,000 people at the march. I think the National Park Service eventually called it for something like that, or 300. And I'll never forget, the guys were like, let's call it for 700,000. And then the other guy was like, I don't think there's 700,000 people. There's 700,000. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just call it for 700,000, and bam, it sticks. 
And of course, we got all of it. They didn't. Re they thought that they were like talking privately. And it was. <laughs> and then you see them come out on stage, and there's a crowd, and they announce. They're like seven hundred thousand strong, <laughs> um, and the crowd goes crazy. And and they were right. It stuck. And. Um, because it wasn't until a few days later the National Park Service does this grid study where they came out, but no one cared that there were only 250,000 people because they had announced it for 700,000. And now, in retrospect, I think that was the first time uh, this idea of fake news actually worked. It was like, oh, that's what they were doing. They were, they were, sent, they were creating a false narrative that many, 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 many people believed, and, and it worked for them. Um, Unfortunately, it happens all, all, too, all too often now, but um, it was quite, quite interesting. And I also met President Clinton for the first time. He was the governor of, uh, uh, of Arkansas, and he was, he was very pro, uh, he was pro-choice, and he was, he was uh, very dynamic, very charming, and there was some whispering that he might run for president. And, and I remember we had him on tape, and I think he said a bad word. We, maybe he used the F word or something, because he, again, also didn't realize the cameras were like over there, but he was mic'd. And um, we ended up editing that out. Um, uh, but I was like trucking along pretty, pretty good. I mean, it was a nice environment. We were working exclusively for Peter, and as such, we, I think we got special treatment. and. Um, and the great thing about it also, I was saying this to some young kids earlier, you, I was really learning at, at, the, at the feet of, 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 you know, of the, the brilliance that was Peter Jennings. Not only brilliant and clever and intelligent, but he had so much integrity. So I never, as a young girl coming up through the ranks, I never learned bad habits. Like I always knew, like if I didn't, if I didn't know the answer, the only thing Peter wanted to hear was, I'll find out. Like, he didn't want to hear, like, well, um, you know, I did try to, I looked it up here, and then I caught someone, but like, oh, yeah, no. He just, like, all, all you had, and it was a good lesson. It's like, no one wants to hear the process. Like, I'll, I'll find out. I'll get back to you. And we, he kept us on our toes. And, uh, and to this day, all of these skills um, come into play in, in my everyday life. Like, I feel like I, I learned from the best, and I didn't pick up bad habits, and I'm extremely thorough. Um, and, uh, you know, most of my emails now, they used to be memos, even emails I write, or, you know, are footnotes, like everything <laughs> is very organized. And, um, but it was great. And then, of course, the Gulf War was still going on, still going on, and Peter wanted to do some specials. And this is a great story because it's, um, it was, so he was doing an hour special called A Line in the Sand. And it's like three big 12-minute pieces about what was going on. Um, this was, may have been the one that the, the, the war had just ended, and they were going, like, what? I think it was line in the sand, what have we won, or something like that. And I was assigned to it as an AP. Now, I was like a big shot. Just an AP, but I felt like a big shot. And, uh, and we were thinking about, like, what stories are to tell, what kind of stories, what kind of stories. And I read in the Washington Post, I'll never forget, a tiny little article about this town called Fallujah. And, uh, and there, it was a, it, Fallujah had a, a military base, and there was questions. Maybe there was chemical warfare heads on, in the military base, and of course the the United Nations, the, the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, was in charge now of going into Iraq, if you remember, and and finding, uh, you know, destroying all the weapons of mass de mass destruction and all that. So the head, this guy named David Kay was heading this UN mission. And there was just a tiny article about David Kay and his group trying to get into this facility in Fallujah, and they were turned away. And there were two blurry pictures of what looked like um, Mack trucks going out the back end of the military base uh, and maybe taking away the chemical uh, warheads. And uh, I thought, oh, you know, Maybe we can get those two pictures, and we do something about weapons of mass destruction. And here's this guy, David Kay. He runs it. So, you know, I call the UN, and, and this is another thing about reporting. It's 
everyone who you speak to gives you a tiny bit of information, whether they know it or not, and then it leads to the next call and the next call. It's really a telephone game. And eventually, I got a phone number for the uh, UN Atomic Energy Agency in Switzerland, I think. I'm like, oh, I'm going to try it. But I remember it was the time difference was very late in, in Switzerland. And I called this number and asked for David Kay. And he picks up, he answers the phone. And I'm like, oh, this is weird, OK. David Kay, the head of the UN whole mission, is answering the phone. But it was probably like 11 o'clock at night over there, or midnight. And I was like, hi, I'm Carol. Uh, DeFalco, this is before I got there. Oh, Carol DeFalco from ABC News, and Peter Jennings is doing a story on, uh, on Iraq and, and weapons and mass destruction. And, and, and I saw that you were quoted in this article, uh, and there were two like pictures, a little blurry, but it looked like they were pictures of uh, trucks uh, transporting weapons outside of the military base. And he said, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got those pictures. Do you want those pictures? I said, oh, yes, thank you. We can, we can you know, put them in the, the show. Some. And he's like, you want the video? And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah, you want the video? I, I'm like, you, you, what, what video? He goes, well, we videotaped the entire scene. Um, uh, it was an hour of videotape of them trying to get into this military base to check on these weapons and them being you know, told by the Iraqis, no, you're not allowed in. And they were shot at. And there was, there was so much drama that was not in this little Washington Post piece. And not only that, but David Kay happened to be flying to the UN the next day. And I said, where are the videotapes? He goes, oh, I have them. He goes, you want me to bring them with? I said, well. You know, I'm dying now because I'm thinking, holy oh, shit, I've uncovered something big. Um, I said, yeah, David, why don't you come to New York, go to the, but, you know, here's my number, or my numbers, and my, yeah, you know, maybe you can, you know, I'll come to your office. I can meet you at your office and, and take a look at those tapes. He's like, okay, okay. I mean, <laughs> of course, I was there when he landed and um, took a look at the tapes. They were amazing. And um, I showed them to my executive producer, and I told him how I found it. And, and then he let me produce my first piece. It was a three-minute piece. I, edited the, I did an interview with David Kay, and I edited this video down to three, three and a half minutes, and it opened the show. So it was like the open of the show, and it was my first big producing credit. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, I was, finally felt like, oh, I just want to keep track of the time because I talk so much. And they, they told me I only had 45 minutes. Um, anyway, you can imagine. But the, the, the lesson I learned, it's like you think that the, you, you never know what's going to be, you never know what is go, you're going to uncover. And you think it's just like, oh, i got to make another call, and nothing's really going to happen. Do we really need these two blurry pictures of, of, um, of trucks? You can't really see what's going on, Do we, should we tell this story, should we not tell this story? And, um, but the lesson is you just make the call. Like, make the call. Because you never know where it's going to land you. And in this case, it landed me the open of the show. And I think I might have gotten promoted at that point. <laughs> I'm not sure, but the promotion came sometime soon after that. Um, I forgot another, well, I don't know, I don't know another time. I have, I have like 10 minutes. Um, because the, um, it's funny, because I was going through all these, and it sounds like I'm an internationally renowned journalist, because I did a lot of stuff with Peter. But I, just, I was looking at a list of other stuff, just so you know, it's not all like overseas and glamorous and international places. I did the, I'm very proud of saying this, I did the very first story for US national television on Botox, <laughs> right? This is in 1993, and apparently women were injecting poison into their foreheads. And I was like, oh, I got, a, I got a interested in that story. And I, I researched it and reported it. And, and it was the, the, it was the, and, and it was, po I mean, it wasn't, po I mean, everything's poison. If you, I remember the doctor, she was so funny. She goes, well, aspirin is poison if you take enough of it. Uh, and she says, and no one can afford enough Botox to poison yourself, because it was very expensive at the time. But this was before the FDA approved it. And, and now, since every, now, 
maybe not everyone, but I, everyone I know uses it. <laughs> not me. Ha ha. Wink. <laughs> but the funny thing is, when I was doing the story, I was 30, uh, I don't know, I was 33 or something, and I was way too young to do it. But the doctor was like, oh, I'll do it for you, I'll do it. And part of me was like, no, because I'm covering you as a story, and you know, I cannot accept the gift of that, all that stuff. And it was like, it was, it was, uh, and then, and then I thought, I'm so young, I'm way too young. And now, now I think everyone I know under 35 does it. Um, but anyway, I was the very first to put that on the map in the United States. <laughs> and then I, I did some other stories. I, I'll, I'll tell you about one other really quickly. Um, I was in, this was for World News Tonight. This was uh, when I did some uh, work for the evening news. We were doing like a 10 part series like around America. And they sent me to Yellowstone National Park to do a story on the bison because the bison were overrun in Yellowstone. They, they, and the, the ranchers right around Yellowstone were complaining that the bison were coming into their cattle and getting their cattle sick with this something called brucellosis. And don't ask me what brucellosis was, but it was something bad that these, ra these ranchers were not happy with. And sadly, this is really like a sick story, and the National Park Service, the department um, responsible for taking care of the bison and the parks and stuff, were culling the, culling the, crap, the, culling the, the herd and basically killing the bison because there were too many. And the sad thing about it was bison are not that bright, so you can literally walk up to them and shoot them. And if there's like three or four in a row grazing, you can then shoot the other, because they don't run. It was terrible. It was just, it was awful. Um, but it turned out they weren't giving the rancher cattle brucellosis, so when it aired, that, that and, and we exposed this policy of the Park Service doing this, um, so that we put an end to that. But I only tell you that story because while I was doing that story, I got a call from the news desk. They said, we have a tip about the Unabomber. I was like, yes. They, <laughs> there was some rumor talk about the Unabomber being in the vicinity. I was uh, in Montana, Idaho, and the park. Um, would you check it out? This is what I mean about journalists are weird because why are you going to like drive into the 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 you know to the nowhere's you know in the in the mountains look for the Unabomber? But we were like, let's go. <laughs> so we get in our car and we drive, drive, drive. Um, we we pull over at this one little bar that's on this deserted road called the A-frame. And we're like, you know this guy, he lives in a, a log cabin, sort of, in, oh yeah, yeah, they called him David something. And uh, we're like, how can we get to him? And they, they kind of gave us directions, it was like a dirt road and make a left. And, the, and we show up at this guy's log cabin, thinking, you know, I don't know, at that point I'm like, is this really the Unabomber? It seems really easy to get to him. <laughs> and, but the fact is, we, sh we were in a rental car, which looks, by the way, apparently like FBI cars. And the guy <laughs> flips out because he thinks the FBI is now coming to question him. And, and, uh, and, and, he, and he, he wasn't the Unabomber. But he did say that I was not the first person to arrive, that the FBI had, in fact, been at his cabin like a few weeks earlier. And, uh, and he told him what he, he looked like. He could be the Unabomber. He was, he, he had, he was living in a log cabin with no electricity. He had like a typewriter, and he had books floor to ceiling. And I don't know what he was, how he was living. But um, the FBI came to question him. And he, um, it turned out that they caught the Unabomber like a month later, it, not there in Idaho, but like in that vicinity, in a very similar log cabin with no electricity. So that was as close as I ever came to the Unabomber which is pretty close. <laughs> like I was like. Um, and then I wanted to end by, by um, I was, as Christiane uh, mentioned in her introduction, um, my husband passed away uh, in 99, the end of 99 of cancer, a long illness with cancer, as did his cousin John Kennedy and his wife and, and uh, Carol and her sister Lauren, all very, very, very close uh, friends and family. And um, it really shifted things in my life. Like to say I was at a crossroads was, it just, there was a major shift. And I had been at ABC then at that point, like 12 or 15, 14 years, and I loved it. And, 
and Anthony also worked there. So we were like part of that whole ABC family. And, um, you know, when he passed away, it just, it changed me in a way that I can't really describe other than I just felt like this whole life I had been living um, felt like an old, something that uh, did no longer really existed for me, that I felt like, and I was 34, 35, and um, I knew it was probably coming to, to an end. Um, and I, I, I just continued to work, because it's all I knew. I did other stories, and, and then the Afghanistan war broke out, and I thought, this is the perfect thing. Because the great thing, of, one of the great things about being a journalist is it, it affords you the ability to run away from your life and to get into someone else's story. So I just, the only thing I wanted to do was get out of New York, get out of my own story, and be somewhere, like I said, these, the frayed edges of life where everything, you felt everything more intensely. And um, so they sent me. I don't know what I did to, uh, to, set, to um, convince them that I, <laughs> but anyway, they sent me. And... Um, and I arrived in, in Afghanistan, as Christian said, at the 101st Airborne Division. And it was, fourth, it was in Kandahar, which I don't know if you remember, it was the, the airport. Um, it was the old airport, it was the, the bombed out airport. It was a white building and it had like, you know, like arches. And I arrived right in the, what turned out to be towards the end of the war. The la it was right after the last big ground offensive. I think it was called Operation Anaconda. And, um, and that happened like the previous month. So they were sort of winding down ground operations, but I was there to do this docu-series called Profiles from the Frontline, which let me just tell you a funny story, and then I wanted to read you part of an essay I wrote on my time there. Um, profiles, we would go around saying, we're doing, you know, we're doing a story, a docu-series called Profiles from the Frontline, and all the soldiers would be like, what, what are you calling it? Profiles. We're profiling. And it turned out, no, none of them said it. We only learned this after. If you're profiled as a, as a soldier, it means you're at a commission. Like you, you're, <laughs> you're delisted or something. But, you know, in our, in our, uh, in our world, it was that you were being uh, highlighted. So, I get there, and it's 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 pretty rough. It's not the it's not the Intercontinental Hotel in Tel Aviv. It's 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 tents. It's it's as far as the eye can see tents, uh, and communal shower and um, MREs, and it's 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 the army. You basically enlisted in the army, and I was there only with a camera guy and a sound person. There wasn't even that much press there because the action sort of had moved to the capital, Bagram. Um, but I had to film with this, this unit that I was assigned to. And, um, you know, I don't think that they liked very much. I think, at the, you know, they didn't like very much, to be honest, the woman. Uh, they, they weren't sure about the whole subject, but they were told that they had, they had to do this. And I, I only want to read from this. I'm, I, uh, some of, I've told some of you I'm starting a, another book. Um, it's a collection of essays that I've been writing over the past bunch of years. And I found one, it's kind of rough, but I'm gonna give you a sneak preview um, because it's, it's about my timing in Afghanistan. And uh, hopefully I'll sell it as part of the book, but you guys can listen to it first. Um, okay, we, we had gotten permission to film everywhere on the base and tag along on missions. There was even a letter from Donald Rumsfeld but it becomes immediately clear that once we were in the field with a unit, they didn't care much about permission from Washington. It wasn't disrespectful, but they were there to do a job and made it clear they didn't want anyone getting in the way, especially a woman. So that first week, I was left to fend for myself, unless they realized I had some, until I realized they had, I had something they all wanted, a sat phone, and I am willing to barter. Let me just preface this by saying that we, can't, we, we literally arrived on the base with like our armies. ABC had gotten a discount on, on equipment, so we were like army surplus, like helmets from the Vietnam War, and we were not prepared. We were really not prepared. And, and, and they knew it. The soldiers were like, Ugh, like who are these? I said, um, my crew needs Kevlar vests, night vision goggles, malaria pills. A phone call to mom or a girlfriend back home was all it took to get what we needed three calls for a generator, uh, a half hour for two walkie-talkies. I was bartering all of this. I set up a nice little operation out of my tent. 
I had been filming Captain Cox and his squad each day. There were rumors every day uh, of missions, but it quickly became apparent that the war was winding down. Each day up at 6 a.m. PE, a short walk to the mess for constituted scrambled eggs and grits, which are virtually inedible. The rest of the day is filled with basketball games, watching DVDs, and waiting for orders which never come. It is Groundhog Day without Andy McDowell, which makes for restless bored soldiers. I watch these men, boys really, all of us escaping, all of us running away or toward an undefined thing in our lives. I listen to their stories, bad marriages, poverty, hopelessness, running toward adventure, excitement, a purpose, a desperate desire to define our lives, to make a difference. I have the feeling they've seen Full Metal Jacket a lot. The thing about real war, war is that it has a way of pulling up the slack. Life is reduced to the bare essentials. There are daily phone calls from producers back home re requesting shots of army truck convoys and F-16 fighter jets overheard, never mind, overhead, never mind that there have been no airstrikes or convoys since Operation Anaconda, the last big battle two months earlier. But I am told they have seen such footage on CNN. <laughs> I imagine the executives sitting in their air-conditioned offices while I spend days whiling around away in 120 degree heat. The conversations are always the same, them describing footage that they had seen on the news and me asking, me asking for them to send us a tent. There is a shortage and we have been squatting in a tent belonging to another unit and we are at risk of evacuation, uh, of eviction. The tent, is finally, the tent finally did arrive, an American camper pup tent, which we christened the Pink Palace, even though it was light blue. <laughs> no idea why we, we said that, but, but it was the Pink Palace. The sight of this blue tent in the midst of a military base was too much for any of us. Captain Cox got a few of his men to cover it with camouflage tarp, and we invited people over for afternoon tea. I found my sense of humor that day, serving iced tea to the men of Company A. After the tent situation, I figured it was just a matter of days before, we were able to, before I'd be able to leave. I'm dreaming now about going home, looking forward to it, actually. I got a, I'd been there like six weeks. I'd got, I got a ride on a C5 to the Bagram base near Kabul, a virtual luxury resort compared to Camp Kandahar. I stay one night in the bombed out building that was the ABC headquarters, and the next day I hitch a ride to Kabul. Kabul is a city that you, that you can see was once beautiful. The streets are busy, people going about their business, women in blue, light blue burqas, but still, I walked to Chicken Street, the shopping mecca of Kabul. All but a few of the small shops were open for business. Vendors were selling wool carpets with designed, designed with bombs, helicopters, and US soldiers chasing out the Taliban. Some had stitched 911 on them. The whole story told in a two by three foot carpet. The next, day I got to the, U the next day I got on the UN flight uh, to Islamabad. From there, it was a midnight flight to Dubai. I stepped off the plane from Islamabad into the gold-plated luxury airport. I spotted a Starbucks and almost wept. I was, I was longing for something, anything familiar. If I could pinpoint a moment, it may have been one of the nights while I lay on the runway watching the Chinook helicopters take off with special forces troops staring into the night sky, or maybe the day at the Kabul Zoo, seeing parents with their children all dressed up for the zoo. Never mind the zoo had virtually no animals in it. Most of the residents of the Kabul Zoo didn't survive the war. Marjan, the lion, was mortally wounded after a general, in retaliation uh, for injuring his brother, threw a grenade into the Marjan's cape. Uh, uh, into Marjan's cape. Uh, Oh, I cut off that word off. Well, <laughs> into his cage. Um, a bear named Donatello was repeatedly slashed by Taliban soldiers, so much so his nose fell off. Only the birds, it seemed, managed to survive. But there was something about how all these families came dressed up that made me think how strong the will to survive. All around was evidence of the recent war. Unexploded ordnance lay within the zoo walls. Buildings damaged by bombings surrounded it. But I loved those families. There was hope in that zoo. A simple Sunday afternoon at the zoo, I had my Polaroid camera with me and I took pictures of the kids as they watched them develop, their eyes widening, half scared, half excited. A large group of children gathered, all wanting their pictures taken. They were curious and full of life. I took pictures as fast as I could and handed them out. 
I showed them how to hold them and watch the image develop, and their eyes grew big and round like saucers. They looked up at me wide-eyed, a miracle smack dab in the middle of the war. I must have taken 40 pictures, all of the film I had left. I think it's now when I first start to think about my future, a new and completely different life ahead of me. And that was my, a little bit of my experience in Afghanistan. Um, and it's funny because when I got back from the war, I ended up leaving ABC and, and, and did indeed um, have a new and completely different life. Had I known then that I was going to be on a reality show, <laughs> and if someone had said I was going to be, that would be a, big of, a bit of a stretch. But um, nevertheless, um, I, did go, I did come back, and, and I did leave ABC, and I wrote a couple of books, and then winded up in reality. Um, people always ask me, I guess I have a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't have a few minutes. <laughs> If you could see Jeff on the side, <laughs> he's dying. <laughs> um, but I, well, we could talk about that. There's, there's going to be a Q and A um, session now, and and Adam, if you can come up here, and we're gonna we're gonna open up the uh, audience to questions and ask me anything you want about the show. How are you? Okay, good. Thank you. Wasn't she great? Unbelievable. <laughs> So we have some time for questions, but I also want to let you know, if you didn't get a chance to purchase one of her books from the URI bookstore before the show, you can purchase afterwards. And Carol has graciously agreed to stay and sign books on stage as well. Um, so that is a great opportunity to do so. So we have some students with microphones in the audience, and it's an opportunity to ask questions. But before we do that, uh, we have a little something for you as well, Carol, to oh, thank okay. you and to recognize your contributions to the University of Rhode Island and the Harrington School. We have a whole goodie bag Oh here. my god, I love a gift bag. We'll, we'll start with... Is this swag? Well, we have to start with apparel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and you can't I love leave it. without a Harrington oh god, School URI it. baseball cap. For sure. And since it's getting cold, she needs a winter hat, of course. Oh, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not done yet. Can I put this on now? We have a Harrington oh School God. sweatshirt. That's so good. We're expecting lots of Instagram posts yeah, of yeah, you yeah. wearing this material. <laughs> yeah. I love it. But. Oh, I got an, and an award. Best of all, we have a certificate for you, oh, honoring you, you so for much. delivering the 11th annual Christian Amanpour Lecture in Journalism. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. That's really nice. Thank Signed you so by yours much. truly. We couldn't oh. find you, President Dooley, to sign. <laughs> okay, so, That's so sweet. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand, and we have students with microphones who will come to you. And who has the first question? The first one is always the We have the one hardest. in the front right here. Oh, yeah. but there's. I did go over a little bit, but not that much. You're great. Okay. Hello. Hi, Carol. Hi. Hi. What is your most favorite memory of the Housewives and your least favorite? Oh, my God. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um, oh, my most favorite memory. Um, I guess there, there are a couple. Um, I, you know, during the course, I never thought I would last six years. You know, I thought for some, every year they'd, they'd, get, they'd be like, they'd be like, okay, we get, you know, they, they would, They'd be like, oh, it was nice, but you, you don't fit in. You know, I never really fit in. But they kept every year, year after year after year, saying, oh, my God, we, we love you on the show. We love you on the show. Come back, come back. So I said, oh, OK. But my, so I had a lot of fun on the show. It was, it was uh, a, a steep learning curve, but uh, it was fun. But I would say, well, I, last season, or two seasons, maybe it was last season, I ran the New York City Marathon. It was last season. It was. Oh. <laughs> I love we the fans of the fans. show. Yeah, I love the, the fans of the show know more about my life than I do. I forget. But yeah, so that was a big, that was really, that was an enormous uh, um, uh, feat to film. As you can imagine, there's 50,000 people running that. And then they did a great job 
uh, in filming that and showing that story. And then, of course, I, oh, I met Adam, my boyfriend at the time. Not me, I'm married. Oh. <laughs> And that, that, that moment, it's funny, because that moment exists on, on tape, that, that, and it's a, a funny and unusual thing to have, this moment when you meet someone who you end up having, you know, we had almost uh, you know, three plus year relationship. So, um, so that's a, a fun thing to, to have and to see. He was opening a refrigerator or closing a refrigerator, and I kind of walked up, like, you know, trying to open a bottle of champagne, and we we're like, hi, <laughs> hi. <laughs> and who would have thought three, Plus, years later, we would still be together. But so that was a fun moment, too. Other questions from the audience, please. Right here. Hi. Um, when I was in journalism school in the 80s, we were taught that journalists were the watchdogs of society. So I'd like to know your comments on how you feel versus then versus now. Mm -hmm. Do you feel with the fake news and all, you know, is really, is it fake news and are journalists just pundits? Or just, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, it is, I mean, I, I kind of grew up at the same time as you. As you and. Um, there was definitely, journalists did not get involved in the story. You never knew what a journalist's um, political opinion was. Um, I covered politics as you know, a young person at ABC, and, and I, I didn't even, you know, we didn't donate to campaigns, we didn't, we didn't attend rallies, we didn't do anything. Uh, I would say maybe even sometimes I didn't even vote, which is shocking because <laughs> I'm like a very big proponent of voting, but you know, we, um, and that, I guess, has changed a little bit, for, sh for sure. Um, but I think, I think what's happening now in journalism is just, uh, I, I say it's the best of times and the worst of times, because uh, this administration is positioning the, the journalists as enemies of the state. And, uh, and um, you know, much, li and, and much like, uh, much like they, they, they have done in, in other communist countries, and you marginalize the free press, and then you have problems because the democracy does not run unless you have a free press, and the founding fathers knew that. I know there's a lot of talk about the Second Amendment, um, but uh, the First Amendment is freedom of press. So, um, so it, it's a difficult time, but it's also the best of times because I think there's so much opportunity out there for journalists to really uncover, you know, the truth. And what I said in the beginning, we sort of live in this post-truth age where I really think people don't know the difference between fake news and real news because a lot of people are getting their news on Facebook. And uh, it's, uh, it's just shocking to me that, of course, there was always fake news when we were growing up and it was like National Enquirer and it was aliens and two-headed babies. And you just, you saw it and you're like, oh, that's fake news. Um, but now it's just, it looks real. And and um, and that's a problem, and and um, and that's a problem that was started, I think, by this administration. Yeah. In, in, like with intent. This wasn't just uh, him, uh, Donald Trump saying, "Oh, it's fake news." I think there was a definite intent to marginalize the free press um, because then people are questioning the real stories. People, you know, and, when, and so no, one, you know, he's not held accountable, and no one's going to be held accountable. Right. Next question. Please, right here in the front. Uh, you were behind the scenes with the journalism, journalism in front of the camera um, with the reality. If someone offered you something in front of the camera in journalism, would you be interested? Oh, is that a job offer? <laughs> I would, you know, it's interesting because um, it was so counterintuitive to do the reality show when I had had a a, a pretty significant career behind the scenes. And um, so now coming out of it, um, it was never when I was as a journalist and I was a producer, I always loved to pr be the producer and be behind the scenes. But now there is an opportunity because I've built an audience. Um, the interesting that thing now because of social media is once you leave a show, you bring some of the audience with you. So and that has value. So I'm looking at different, different options. One is you know, finishing this book. And then um, there are a couple other shows that I'm interested in developing, both behind and in front of the camera. Next question, please. Yes, right over here, please. I also think TV is like a young person's game. So like the long, you know, well, it's, it's, I like radio. <laughs> <laughs> Me radio too. you can do from Me your bed. Too. Please. <laughs> 
What advice do you have for student journalists? Oh, geez. Um, um, you know, you have to have a passion for it because it's, it's, and I can only speak to my own experience, and this was many years ago, but um, you, you really have to have a passion for it. And, it's, it's, and you have to be curious by nature and then by training. You, you just have to, you, you ha and, and you'll know it if you have it, this mind of a journal journalist works slightly different than, and you'll see it in your friend groups if you're the one asking a lot of the questions. And if you're genuinely curious about ideas and people, um, you're probably in the right business. Um, saying that, it's hard to break in. It's hard to break in. You have to be very um, persistent and, and relentless. Um, Oh, this is like at the reunion when my phone went off and Andy yelled at me. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know how to turn that off. Uh, um, I interviewed a state senator uh, from Pennsylvania early, early on, and, and for some, I think maybe it was the gun control or abortion documentary, and he said, um, relentlessness is the ability to come back time and time and time again until your opponent gives up her willingness to resist. And I always, and that's what you have to be, you have to be relentless. Um, you have to be able to come back time and time and time again until you get the answer that you want, until you get, until you really achieve that goal, whatever it is. You, and, and also, you have to set your goals much higher than, like when I said I wanted to, I, I want to, you know, I want to be, you know, in news. And yeah, I want to work for ABC because it's number one. It seems reasonable, right? If you're going to do it, you might as well work for the number one guy instead of the number two guy. That was my whole thought process. But then it happened, you know. So, so there is something about, about, you know, creating it in your head, thinking about it, and just saying it over and over and over again and not listening to the haters. We have time for a couple more questions. There's one right in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, so to piggyback on two of the earlier questions, you had a lot of really great insight um, on your journalism career and knowing that there's a lot of, hopefully a lot of communication students in the room. Thinking about how the world of journalism and media has evolved over the last two decades and even in the last couple of years, what sort of skills or insight would you give to students as they're coming out of you know, school in the next couple of years and entering the world of journalism and media? You know, <clears throat> the, the world of journalism now is so completely different than when I was coming out of school. And you basically worked at one of the, th if you wanted to work on a national level, you worked at one of the three networks or CNN. And CNN was like this crazy, like, cable thing 24-7. Um, and that Christiane was basically fronting. She was like the star, the only one there um, of note. Um, now, uh, <laughs> now there's so many different avenues to, to pursue. It's not no longer, you know, if you want to work in network news, it's, there, you have so much choice. So in, in a way, it makes it harder. You know, sure, there's a lot more to choose from, but it makes it harder to really focus on what is the one thing that you really want to do. Um, and, and I can only say you, you really have to be, again, like relentless in in focusing on your goal, right? So if it's network news or if it's print, print is kind of like gone away. So I wouldn't really focus on print <laughs> at all. Um, but the digital space is huge and there's so much opportunity, but you almost can get lost in the digital space. So I really think you have to narrow focus and you have to really have an understanding of like, Think of the place that, like I did, I wanted to work at ABC because it was number one. What is the place that you, like your dream place to work? And then like back it up, like, you know, unpack it and say, okay, that's where I want. So I'm going to do this, this, and this. But always, you have to always hold on to that original goal because there's just so much distraction and there's so many, you know, you can take a left-hand turn. And I know so many people who did this out of college that they wanted to be in journalism and they wanted to do that, but they... You know, they took this other job because it's like it was paying more, a little more money, and they would just they would just do that for now, and you know, at a bank or something. And then, you know, ten years later, they're still in banking, and it's not really what they wanted to do. So, you just have to you just have to be very grounded and very persistent, and and keep your eye on the prize. 
And that was true back then, but it's, it's even more true now. Question in the front row here, and we have time for, I think, one more, or maybe two after. Um, <clears throat> my hat. Carol, Look, you yourself. Taking pictures? I love that. Okay. Awesome. Just realize. <laughs> Carol, you yourself said that just by nature of having cameras in the room, uh, that changes people's behavior. Yeah. Um, what about being on a reality TV show felt real for you? What part of it was real? Mm -hmm. Like what, when you the watch title. the show, what feels real to you? Or does it feel completely? I don't, even when I watch it? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't really, honestly, I don't really watch it. Um, it's not, it's interesting. Everyone asks, is that, is, your, is that show scripted? It must be scripted. Come on, the producers tell you to say those things. And honestly, it is not. It's not scripted. Um, I would certainly write better lines for myself uh, and, the, and the other women. Um, but it's, it's, it's entertainment. So um, it's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a fiction. You know, it's not, it's not the, the truth of what's going on. It's not the, certainly the facts of what's happening. Um, but it's some sort of entertaining um, fiction uh, presented as, as a fact. But, um, you know, my standards of my stand, I always came to blows with like some of the executives and stuff because I'd be like, that's actually not what happened here and here. And I'm always giving like evidence, like look at this email and look at this text message. And no, I have, and they were like, uh, we, <laughs> this isn't 60 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, but wait, that's not actually really what happened. But you can imagine they, they filmed, you know, uh, I was saying almost 100 hours a week. Uh, and about one week of filming is one episode of the show. So, you know, they can craft stories and create, create a really dramatic stuff. Out of, I'm like, I was at that dinner, then it wasn't, <laughs> this is kind of boring for the most part. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. I see some students right over on the right. We certainly want to leave time for Carol to sign books and also to get all the way back to New York City, so. Oh, well, I have time. We have a half hour, so we're fine. My astrologist just called. I wonder what that means. <laughs> I love Hi. her. So um, I really enjoyed your speech. I'm right over here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your speech, and um, there were. I'm not a student of journalism, but there were a lot of themes that I picked up that I think would apply to a lot of people who are crafting their career. And so I wanted to know how you would round out this list. Um, the, theme that, the themes that I picked up were um, that you have to have a sense of urgency, that you, um, no job is too big or too small, and that you have to fake it till you make it. Also, um, that no one wants to hear the process, just the answer, um, just to make the call, so be fearless, and you don't know where it will land you, and also to be relentless, um, especially when it comes to being a woman in an industry that is male-dominated. Domin and also when it comes to overcoming that imposter syndrome. How would you, like, what advice would you give? What kind of, what's the syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Imposter. Yes, imposter. Oh, I didn't know that was a syndrome, <laughs> but I like it. You know, um, all, the whole list of what you read is, is everything you need to, to do to really um, achieve any goal, yeah, and it's, it's Especially, like, think about it. You're at a college, and you're still super young, and you really don't know what your life's going to be like. So you're trying to create a narrative that you hope will last 10 or 15 or 20 years, right? It's really daunting. Um, so um, you, you really have to keep your presence of mind. Like, when you say, no job is too big or too small, like, and one phone call leads to another, leads to another, to another. All of those things are really true. And, the only thing that I, I have this thing about fake it till you make it, because I, ne I, I didn't do, I, I don't, I didn't uh, consciously do that. And I know that's something that people say, fake it till you make it. But I did, I didn't fake it. I, I was, when I was an intern, I was the best intern that you could have ever had. You know, I didn't try to be something I wasn't. And I think that's really important to whatever you're doing at the present moment is exactly what you should be doing. And if you do that thing 110%, then this other thing is gonna happen. Then you do that, then, then you are that person, and you do that, and you give 110% to that. Um, I think that's a better model than 
trying to act a certain way with the hopes of then becoming that person. Um, that's what that's what I, that's sort of what I would focus on. One last question for our speaker, right there in the back on the right. We're getting a lot of extra questions in. Yeah. If you could ask our president one question, oh, no. what would it be? <laughs> president of the United States or president of University of Rhode Island? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my God. Uh, um, I, I, uh, that's a, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't, I wouldn't even, uh, there's really nothing that I would, there's, there's just, there's no one question that I, that I could or would ask him. Um, I don't believe him to be someone who has the intellectual and moral compass to lead this country. Um, I don't think that there's any, answer that he could give me to change my mind on that and whether his policy, whether I agree with one policy or another and I likely don't agree with any of his policies. I just, I don't think he has the, has the capacity to, to um, lead this country and I think he shows that to us every single day. So um, I wouldn't want to ask him a single question. I, I would not because I wouldn't want the answer. Well, Carol, you've said a lot. Oh. And, <laughs> I talk a lot. And we appreciate it. We've <laughs> learned you. a great deal tonight. I, I wonder if, if President Trump is one of your million social media followers. Definitely not. <laughs> but you know who does follow me on Twitter? The Mooch. Scaramucci. <laughs> Remember that guy? <laughs> he was like the, the director of communications for like 10 yeah. days. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Randomly. Sure. Carol, thank you so much for coming here today. Let's give her a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.